photograph showing the floodplains of the South Allegheny River. That's the South Allegheny River at um, late dry season, so it's just um, in a, a river channel. But um, yes, the, the, the floodplains are enormous. And, um, but because they're so low lying, um, they're, they're very vulnerable to sea level rise and um, uh, saltwater poisoning of, of the freshwater areas, including indigenous cultural heritage sites. So the South Allegheny River is contained within Kakadu National Park, a World Heritage Area. The park is located 12 degrees south of the equator in the wet dry tropics with a long dry season from April to November and a shorter but intense wet season from De December to March. The park was nominated for World Heritage listing on account of its natural and cultural values natural values including the diversity of its geography and flora and fauna. Cultural values include a prehistoric record stretching back 50,000 years, and contact in historical sites, exceptional rock art, and the living knowledge of Aboriginal traditional owners. So, this this project is funded by Australian Research Council. Um, it's an ARC linkage program and, to, and promoting a, a national research partner, partnership with industry to encourage the transfer of skills, knowledge and ideas as a basis for securing commercial and other benefits of research. Our industry partner is Kakadu National Park and one of the outcomes of our research will be public education by the park regarding the protection of cultural heritage from the impacts of climate change. A major outcome for the project will be greater understanding of the implications and management challenges associated with climate change by contextualising threat and change in the history of past change. So we have a multidisciplinary team, um, and that's including um, skills in archaeology, bioanthropology, paleoecology, social history, and cultural heritage, and which will doc that this. Um, our, our partners will um, document occupational and environmental histories associated with the river from the mid Holocene to historical times. Um, and I'd just like to uh, point out between Mike Carmichael, who'll be giving a, a follow up paper to um, this one later on this afternoon. The South Alligator River is the largest of the, of the rivers in the Alligator Rivers region. The prehistoric archaeology has focused on two main areas of interest. This one on the lower reaches of the river in the north, centered on the Kalali Plain. And this area, which is in the middle reaches of the river around its confluence with the Nalanchi Creek. Um, there are a number of different site types on the plains, all of which are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. There's concentrations of um, stone artifacts. Uh, so it includes a, a variety of tools, including blades, stone points, silica polished flakes, which are thought to have been used to um, harvest silica rich plants from, from the floodplains. And there are also ground artifacts, um, hollows in rock, out, uh, rock, rock outcrops, mortars and pestles, and edge ground axes. There are shell mounds and middens like these in the Kalali Plain. And also quarry sites like this um, oak quarry. And there are also um, sacred sites with traditional significance to the, the local traditional owners. There are historic sites um, like this Buffalo Shooters Camp. One of our students is working on these sites and there are old cattle stations. There are also earth mounds like these, and they have a similar range of artifacts to the artifact concentrations on the edge of the floodplains. <coughs> so um, there's been like a long history of environmental change on these floodplains. Um, so um, it, this evolutionary history is well documented, and um, it was. 
The change was initiated by post Pleistocene sea level rise, which flooded down Cut River valleys. Subsequent pro processes of siltation led to the big swamp phase when mangroves colonized the floodplains from about 8,000 to 6,000 years ago. And further siltation and coastal progradation led to the cutting off of the tidal influence and the retreat of the mangroves to the river channels and the coast, and a period of transition when the mosaic of estuarine and freshwater environments existed on the flooded plains between about 5,000 and 2,000 years ago. With the ponding of fresh water from the annual monsoon against the Chenears, freshwater wetlands and the exceedingly rich floral and faunal resources became widely established on the floodplains from about 2,000 years ago. These floodplains are extremely low-lying and are only a metre or two above sea level. Tidal influence extends up to 100 kilometres up the channel on the South Alligator River. So the paleo-environmental research demonstrates the transition from estuarine to freshwater environments in the late Holocene. With these changing conditions, broad-scale archaeological evidence suggests that rock shelter sites were occupied sparsely in the early Holocene, with a substantial increase in occupation during the big swamp phase, when estuarine resources were plentiful. During the uncertainty of the transition phase, rock shelters were abandoned, settlement became more mobile, and economic strategies were more varied in all regions. At the same time, the coast was rapidly prograding, and large single-species shell mounds were built mainly from 3,000 years ago. With the formation of the freshwater wetlands 2,000 years ago, settlement patterns differed between river systems. Rock shelters were reoccupied, earth mounds proliferated, and large stone artifact concentrations indicate the occupation was focused on the margins of the subcoastal freshwater wetlands. On the coast, shell mound building in the north ceased about 500 years ago, and settlement was characterized by small, diffuse middens and earth mounds. Today, traditional owners still occupy the coastal plains and actively hunt and fish and gather traditional plant resources from wetlands, now using modern equipment such as rifles, crowbars, dinghies, etc., replacing traditional methods. Now, the coming of the Europeans heralded dramatic environmental impacts on the freshwater floodplains of Kakadu. Asian water buffaloes escaped from the British settlement of Port Essington to the northeast and they colonised the floodplains in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, causing extensive damage until they were shot out in a major campaign of the brucellosis and tuberculosis eradication campaign in the 1990s. However, this operation has not been maintained and buffaloes are again posing an environmental threat to the floodplains and cultural heritage. Likewise, feral pigs have been creating havoc European arrival interrupted indigenous burning regimes and resulted in, in lot late crises and intense fires due to fuel buildup. There are also natural processes that damage sites like channel encroachment of the river that, that varies according to annual rainfall and siltation in the floodplains. And uh, so many of these environmental processes that, that could have occurred in the past uh, predict what is likely to happen in the future with climate change. All of, all of these will affect these low-lying cultural heritage sites. Managers and traditional owners are looking for solutions. So these, these methods will not save the sites from the impacts of climate change, but will help preserve information for the future before it is lost. In the following presentation, Batoon's presentation, <coughs> um, he will talk about the tools for achieving these outcomes and involving indigenous ranges in cultural heritage recording and monitoring programs. One of the exciting new technologies now at our disposal for locating previously unrecorded sites in vulnerable areas is LIDAR. <clears throat> its use will definitely speed up identification of elevated sites such as earth mounds as it can pick up the elevation changes to within 50 centimetres. On the slide, the purple dots in the yellow squares are, are GPS points on earth mounds that we have already identified. In the orange squares are features that by the shape, length, width and height appear to be more earth mounds. Confirmation still requires ground truthing, but this use of LIDAR will save hours if not days of survey time, 
It will also be useful in monitoring of sites for environmental change, such as channel encroachment. And thank you for listening. And you'll get more details of, of what is being done to um, monitor these sites this afternoon in the two weeks.